when I got booked after I got arrested for trying to steal a a cop car um when wow. I got when, when I got booked by the officer and he looked at me and said with a smile on his face like so pompous uh welcome to a life in the system I was so angered by it that I felt like in that moment I wanted to do every single thing in my power to prove him wrong to just be the opposite of what was expected of me Hello and warm welcome to the stories we tell I'm Nitishanti a teacher and facilitator of conscious living here at Round Glass On this show we share the gift of illuminating stories. Each week you'll hear a life story from me and a special guest on a universal theme. Stories of self-acceptance, overcoming inconceivable odds, embracing change and recognizing our limitless nature while honoring our humanity. Success can be questioned and expanded. Being rich, being influential, being knowledgeable, being powerful, being accomplished, having all the nicest things. These are the traditional definitions of success. While there's nothing inherently wrong in them, they are rather narrow, outwardly focused, and based on measuring ourselves against each other in some way. What if you are already successful based on your own values and just never recognized it? In today's episode, I'd like to share how I challenged the traditional definition of success I was given and I'd love to hear from our guest today Rosie Acosta and learn from her journey and her experience she'll be sharing with us her story of how she came to find a success based on radically loving herself. My own journey began with the experience of meeting people who were not following the traditional definition of success. I actually had a school teacher called Peter. He was from South Africa. and he'd given up a successful career in south africa to become a school teacher in india and he was he was my puppetry teacher and uh, we spent a lot of time with him not only making puppets but putting together a, a show for the entire school several times and what i learned from him was that he had discovered that he got his joy from teaching and from being a spiritual seeker and then at some point he kind of mysteriously disappeared from our lives i don't know where he went and i heard some rumors about him going to going to sri lanka it was many years later that i met him and he told me his story that he'd become a buddhist monk while he was in sri lanka and he spent 7 or 8 years in the deep forest practicing meditation and i was very amazed by his experiences and something about meeting him and some of the other people that would come in that gathering when i'd be with him it gave me a completely new idea of how one could live one's life one doesn't have to just follow the usual role of go to college and get a job and try to earn as much money as possible he kind of opened my mind to oh there could be other ways of being i remember taking long walks with him and one day we were sitting on the roof of where he was staying and we were meditating in the evening the sun was setting and i felt this uh, indescribable peace and i asked him that uh, is it possible for me also to to try a different kind of life and he smiled very sweetly and he said well what's stopping you and we had a beautiful conversation another thing that really helped me was writing my own obituary when i was in college i read this book by stephen covey where one of the exercises was to write your own obituary in great detail what will people say about you when you die and writing that obituary made me really question a lot of the values i was being given in my mba school and it made me realize that in the in the obituary i wrote what my family said and my friends said and the people who barely knew me said none of them were talking about how much money i earned none of them were talking about how famous i was they were talking about kind of human being i was the kind of values i had whether i was fun to be with whether i was kind whether they could trust me and i completely made me rethink what i was running after so benjamin zander who wrote the book the art of possibility define success in a really unique way he says success is being surrounded by people with shiny eyes so if you come home and people have shiny eyes you're a successful family member if you go to work and people have shiny eyes you're successful at work 
If you meet your friends and they have shiny eyes, you're a successful friend. But if you come home and the shine disappears from people's eyes, or you go to work and people lose the shine in their eyes, you meet your friend and they're like, oh, here he comes again. Then something's off. And so that has to do with your way of being. So in today's episode and the, I'm sure it'll be a very inspiring conversation with Rosie, we'd like our listeners to get some insights into different ways of defining success and perhaps coming up with their own definition of success, not even limited to what Rosie and I say, but to take some of the things we're sharing and discussing to really reevaluate and say, is that the only way what society tells us is success? Having a large Instagram following, having a best-selling book, being a famous person, being well-known, looking really nice, you know, having that so-called ideal body shape, which by the way changes every few decades what the ideal body shape should be. And really asking ourselves, is there a deeper way of defining success? Rosie, very warm welcome to the show. So Rosie grew up in a low-income area in Los Angeles. She witnessed violent crime and poverty firsthand and even had her own run-ins with the law. As a teen, Rosie made a choice to change her life and search for mindfulness through yoga. Rosie is now a health coach, meditation and yoga teacher, a podcaster, and an author, a definition of a success to many. But Rosie has had to repeatedly remind herself that the milestones of her own success do not always equal happiness. I'm looking forward to hearing more. Thank you for joining us, Rosie. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm I'm curious what your definition of success is now. You're just talking about it. I'm just like curious. Yeah, thanks for asking. My own definition of success is I through my life and work, would like to plant seeds, incorruptible seeds of awakening in every person I encounter. Incorruptible seeds of awakening, which will blossom either immediately or later. But through my way of being, I want to stir something deep in them that gets them to be self-realized and self-actualized. That's my definition of success. Wow. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I think it's a great invitation for people to discover what that means for them. So, And I'd love to hear from you about how your definition of success has changed over the years and some of the important life events that got you, got you here. Yeah, I mean, I feel like this definition for me, as you said in the beginning, is ever-changing. I think, as you mentioned about even how the ideal body over time, over decades, it changes. And just our perception of what we think success is or happiness is, is dynamic. It's not static. And I find huge comfort in that, especially when we go through these moments in life where we go through the peaks and valleys of life. I I definitely grew up in a chaotic time during one of the most violent times in LA history. And I won't bore you with the details, but I did experience a lot of trauma at a very young age. And so by the time I was a teenager, I was doing what most teenagers my age exposed to the same things do. They act out, they get in trouble with the law, they become uh, dependent on drugs and alcohol, and it is just a downward spiral. And so fortunately... After uh, the third time I got arrested, I was faced with making a decision, having that pivotal moment in my life where I had to decide to make a change, right? I did not want to be a part of the system. And there was some feeling that I had within me that said that this was not the way that I was supposed to live my life, almost like I was experiencing my life from this higher vantage point. And it's interesting because people have asked me when that moment was where I realized that I was in this higher vantage point. And I do remember when I got booked after I got arrested for trying to steal a a cop car um, when wow. I got when, when I got booked by the officer and he looked at me and said with a smile on his face like so pompous uh welcome to a life in the system i was so angered by it that i felt like in that moment i wanted to do every single thing in my power to prove him wrong to just be the opposite of what 
was expected of me. I didn't want to be a statistic. I knew what the odds were of me surviving that system. I'd seen it so many times. So I made a decision to be radical, to move against the grain, to make different choices, to do the opposite of what was normal to me. And so I think that began to define what success meant to me because success, the sort of benchmark, uh, the barometer, I guess you could say, to success was very low. The bar was set very low. For my family, it was like, don't get a tattoo and don't get pregnant. Those were like, you were a success if you, wow. hmm. if you, and you made it out alive, right? So that you were automatically a success, you know, a child, a first gen Mexican American child of immigrants, like my family already felt like they had provided the best possible opportunity to be in this country, to to grow up here. And so that felt very much like I didn't necessarily have to do very much to be successful. But at the same time, there was this internal desire to just do more and to just be the best, whether it was spoken or unspoken, that I really needed to perform at the highest level as I possibly could in order to not end up being you know, the the result of my predisposition, my socioeconomic inheritance that I call it. So I can't say necessarily I had a role model specifically, but there were people in my life that opened the door that showed me what the world was like outside. The, mo- the people that impacted my life the most were my school teachers, were people that actually cared and that actually cultivated my gifts, like my kindergarten teacher who opened up my love for writing and my sixth grade teacher who opened up my world of creativity. I think little by little, I started to just show up for my life. Like I started to just create a routine, which I didn't have. I didn't have, my parents were separated, so I didn't really have any supervision. I was basically left to my own devices. And I, and I honestly, I can't tell you exactly how I came up with this system of having a routine and just having somewhere to go and creating a schedule. And I remember asking my mom if I could get a job in the mall when I was 15, even though I was on probation, because I just wanted to make my own money and have a little bit of independence and have a little bit of that validation. And I found having that first mall job, having people give me the positive feedback of showing up and being on time. And I started to get this reputation of being somebody that was reliable. I really liked that. You know, I really loved to be there for people. I've always been such a nurturing person. And so I loved showing up and being the person that people could always count on, the one that was that was always filling in shifts for people, the one that was just the yes person. And I think that's Nitya where I started to really feel that sense of confidence, that that uh, affirmation within myself that felt good. It was unlike anything else that I had ever experienced. You're reminding me of uh, when I was a teenager and I would I had pretty low self-esteem and I'd compare myself to others all the time and feel inadequate in pretty much every way. And it was similar. It was uh, getting into some kind of a routine where I just wake up and I do some exercise and I would read a book and I would meditate for a while. And I just feel so good doing that. And also the validation, I began attending these meditation courses. And for the first time, people gave me a lot of validation. They said, wow, you're so young and you're meditating and you're, you know, you're going to have such a great life. And, and no one had ever, ever, ever said that to me before. So I can really resonate and relate to what you're saying and how yeah. the nurturing aspects of you, which were probably not coming out in other ways, they got a chance. Even in that simple job, you had a chance to show up and, and, and fill in for other people and how that really gave you a different way of looking at yourself. Yeah, I love that. And I'm I'm curious for you if it was the same thing, because it's sometimes too much of a good thing, right? Did you have to learn how to not always then seek the validation of others? You know, I, I find that's like a little bit of a slippery slope, right? Because yeah, yeah. when you've never had the positive validation from somebody and then all of a sudden you have it, then all of a yeah. sudden you're like, oh, I like this, you know, give me more <laughs> of this. Did mm-hmm. you experience that as well? 
I think I became a bit of an evangelist with meditation and I just wanted everyone to meditate and and I would steer almost every conversation towards meditation. I'm like I'm think I would say that's because you guys are not meditating. That's because you're not meditating. Every problem is because you're not meditating. It's like if all you have is a hammer then the whole world is full of nails, you know. And uh so I guess I in my case I guess I became really very critical of myself that I got a, a, this idea that if I don't do my morning meditation and my morning routine then I can't have a happy day. Mm. So I had to actually unlearn that. I got too hung up on this routine and I got too hung up on I've got to do my hour of yoga and I've got to do my breathing practices and I've got to do my reading and I've got to do my meditation, I've got to do my visualization. And if I do all of that perfectly, then I'm then I'm allowed to have a good day. So I had to unlearn that. That took me a while to unlearn. Wow. So it was yeah. 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 Well, I think that that's really interesting. <laughs> I can totally relate to this in so many yeah. levels because <laughs> I can easily attach and I'm a big fan, you know, I I love yoga philosophy and I I practice yoga and attachment is one of the main <laughs> like reasons why we suffer and so having that attachment to something and gripping so hard that the thing that brings you peace becomes the thing that brings you anxiety and stress and suffering right so i think it's the reason why i feel like i've had to redefine my own definition of success is because of that attachment because i think oh when i get here then i'll be happy and then i get to this place and then i and then i don't feel happy and then it's like oh what that means when i get to the next when i accomplish the next goal then i'll be happy right. or when i when i start a podcast then i'll feel successful or when i get a book deal then i'll be successful actually when i finish the book then i'll be successful or when i actually the book is out then i'll feel successful and it's like this constant elusive place that there is no there there <laughs> mm-hmm. you know there is no there there that we get to it's just now it's just the present moment it's just having the contentment with what is actually here that is is the opportunity to feel that success yeah. even the culture of the place you're in like someone told me when they were in california they said in california the most stressful someone question someone can ask you is so how's it going <laughs> because now you're supposed to tell them all the cool things you're doing and all right. all the, in the last week all the amazing yes. things you achieved and it's and so whereas whereas sometimes just the cultural difference like uh like they say the gift of the east is to accept things the way they are and the gift of the west is to make things better <sighs> but then that has to be balanced right so the the east can get we can get into stagnation we can get so caught up in our traditions and our usual way of doing things that we actually don't really make an effort to question and make things better yeah. and the problem with the west is always trying to make things better and doing the next cool thing you lose the contentment and you lose yes. the simplicity and the joy of life sometimes yeah well that's the nature of the mind the mind always wants what's better that's its job. <laughs> its job is always to want what is better. That that is just the natural state. The the, the mind's design is a computer sure. to to keep you alive but not to keep you happy. That's that's the spiritual path, right, that we get on. So that happened when I was still a teenager. Uh my mom had come home with some pamphlets from the Self-Realization Fellowship, Paramahansa Yogananda, and one of her the friend that had given it to her was a follower of SRF and had brought these pamphlets to her because she had told my mom had told her friend that I was struggling with anxiety and stress and she said that meditation would help and so that was where I sort of fell into this the rabbit hole of of eastern philosophy and I was so into everything new age I just consumed the yoga sutras of patanjali and all i started to learn about buddhism i i read every john kabat zinn book and the art of happiness had just come out with the dalai lama and yes. dr cutler and i was really um it, i just i was consumed by it and i i just be, i had a real affinity to the information but i didn't actually start to practice until i was about that age when i was in my early 20s like fully right. that i became a practitioner because i needed it right mm-hmm. i really needed to find who i was i'm still learning i'm still i'm figuring it out you know it's it's been 20 plus years and i'm still on the path very much so and 
I think it does get easier to inquire within for sure. But it, it also it makes the highs really high, but it also makes the lows really low, I think. Yeah. How did you get your break into television? Oh, yes. I'm like, what? I got into TV. Yes. So I was managing a hair salon in the mall at the Beverly Center uh, near Beverly Hills. So when I was there, uh, this celebrity hairstylist who had worked there at one point came and recruited me essentially to come work at his hair salon. I was 20, I was 19 when I started. And he got a uh, a show for uh, to do a reality TV show on him and the salons and basically his way of life being a celebrity hairstylist on Bravo. It was called Blowout and it was uh, a great, so much fun, fun experience. But I, I definitely learned that I'm not a camera person. I, I don't like <laughs> being in front of the camera. I'm not, I don't have like a big personality. I'm, I did it for three, for three years. It was three seasons. And, um, uh, it actually did, created another sort of step or rung on the route of what success was because right. a lot of people that I grew up with or a lot of people I knew really thought that I was just, I had arrived and I was successful and mm. I'm on TV and I'm, you know, making money and, you know, all of these things. And I, I just was so, I was miserable, you know, I was just so unhappy and, and it wasn't it wasn't necessarily what I wanted to be doing with my life. So Rosie, tell me, how have your definitions of success changed over these years? Well, I think that they're going to continue to change <laughs> as this has been the theme of our conversation, right? <laughs> so I think it'll continue to change. But I remember for the longest time thinking that certain milestones in my life were going to equate that success. You know, earlier in the conversation, I was saying how, oh, we get to here and then oh, I'm not happy or I get to here and now I'm still not happy and now this and, and, and now that, and it just continues. And so I look back at all those benchmarks for me where I can vividly remember that this idea of success is that I believe the idea that I think is success is not really success. You know, I, I can think back to an example of like when I first started my podcast and I really believed that I was going to have like thousands of downloads in overnight. Like I remember I had this idea for a podcast and I really wanted to do it. And I employed my boyfriend to edit it and he had to learn how to edit this podcast together. And once we did and we uploaded it and I had some artwork made and I just knew I uploaded it. And then one night at like eight o'clock, nine o'clock and I went to bed and I woke up the next morning, just so excited. Cause I'm like, how many thousands of people have listened to that first episode? <laughs> and I remember logging on to Libsyn and then hitting the refresh button. And it was like two, <laughs> two people. <laughs> and it was just me and Tori, which I thought was hilarious. Well, so in the moment I was like, Oh, I was devastated. I'm like, Oh, it's fine. <laughs> you know, give it a week. And I'll, once I tell all my people I'm posting on Facebook to my 300 friends, they're all going to download it. It's going to be great. And I was absolutely not correct. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I think that that was mm. the beginning of this ongoing theme for me that I had this expectation. And, and look, I, love that part of myself that is naive because I feel like I wouldn't have written a book had I not had the audacity to believe that, right? That to believe, oh, I'm going to have thousands of people. By the way, it took like two years to finally get a thousand downloads for an episode <laughs> or something. More than that, actually, I think. And um, and being consistent. And at that point, I just decided to not care. And so I want to be careful when I say that I didn't care because of course I care. We always care. Even when we say we don't care, we care. But mm. I think that my idea of success just began to change. And and I'll say my relationship to success began to change because I became less attached to the results. Because the same thing when I decided to write a book and you, I'm sure you can relate to this. Like I wrote a, a I did a proposal and I'm like, oh, I'm going to get an agent. It's going to be so easy was not easy at all. <laughs> Once I found the agent, the agent's like, you need to rework this proposal. That's going to be so easy. It was not. Right. Once I had the proposal finally done, I'm like, well, I'm going to get a book deal and it's going to be so easy. 
it was not. We were rejected 32 <laughs> times. It was like Whoa. not going to see the light of day. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. it was that, the sort of idea of, oh, this is what success means. It means this book is going to be on the New York Times and then I will feel the success when, yeah. if I really think about it, if that happens, I, I don't actually know that I will feel that fulfillment that I'm looking for because it's not mm. it's not something that is fillable with an external accolade, you know? Yeah. So in, in today's experience, what would be your running definition of success? God, that's such a great question. Um I, you know, I, I feel like every day that I don't die is a success, like that I can gauge it from a place of, you know, there's, there is so much going on in the world. Our ability to accept where we are in this moment is the only success that we need in this time, in this place, in this moment. Say it, say it again. It's so powerful our ability to be fully present, fully here, the success of this moment is the only thing that we need to feel success. And connect that to the fact that people also want to have goals and some, like they want to grow in some way. How would you connect this whole thing of being now, recognizing I'm here and this is a precious moment in life? How how does does that connect in some way to having goals and aspirations? Yeah, because I feel that most of us need, mm, most of us enjoy having something to look forward to. We do actually have a need for it, something to aspire to. I feel that it's wise for us to hold those goals lightly. Yeah. as opposed to clench them with our fist to hold them lightly as something delicate and loving as opposed to gripping and holding on to this thing that we're never we're never going to get to and you have a podcast you have a book uh I'm, you're a speaker and what would be instead of looking at these as different things you do, what would be something underlying that's tying it all together? It could be an intention. It could be an overarching theme. Oh, yeah. To spread radical love, to just be (laughs) fully present, to (laughs) inspire resilience, to show and invite people to write their own story, to feel radically loved, to feel radically connected. It's, It's all it's all the same. The The reason is the same with everything that I do. The The reason why I speak, the programs that I teach, the book that I wrote, the next book I'm going to write, like the podcast, everything is, is stems from that. Yeah. I'm just, I'm, I'm called to do this work for whatever reason. You know, I, as somebody just asked me, who I wrote the book for, you know, like who, what do you want people, what do you want to teach people? What do you want people to know? And I didn't write this book thinking that way. You know, I didn't write this book saying like, oh, people need to hear this. And then that's great. And I know people do, but I, I don't give myself, I don't, I don't intuit that I, I know much, but I know that I wrote the book I needed to read for myself. So I, I would hope that that would be of service to somebody out there. I think it's a very powerful book you've written, the topic of self-love, radical love, self-love, because that's something I struggled with for so long. And I see constantly, even so-called successful people, uh, when they open up and they start sharing how vulnerable they are and how critical they are themselves, this whole thing of being perfectionistic and beating themselves and beating others for some arbitrary standard that they've set and creating so much of stress around that. So for someone who's maybe a teenager, for someone who's maybe going through a difficult relationship, maybe a breakup, maybe they've they've lost a job or they think they might lose their job, or even if outwardly things are fine, but inwardly they feel that they just they just don't like themselves. What are some of the things you can share with them from your experience? I mean, I think that the the most important relationship that we need to get right with is our is ourself. That's the one, the most intimate, the most important one. There's a voice that that comes in for those of us who have struggled with self-love or lack thereof. 
And one of the most effective exercises that I've done or that I've recommended that people do is to name it and to give it a a totem of some sort or name her, you know, whatever you want to call her, him, them, they, that represents that part of you that comes in and to say it's not helpful when that that voice begins to go off you can just say out loud not helpful or no thank you not right now i feel like that's the initial if i'm really getting into the nitty gritty of what happens during that cycle for me it's always a voice that begins oh you're this or you're not good enough or whatever it may be and it's a it's a quick downward spiral then it's an energy thing then it's a physiological thing my breathing is altered and i'm not breathing my shoulders are tense my body gets constrict constri- constricted and i feel like i can't move right the actual feeling of being stuck begins to take place i i sit down i'm lethargic i don't want to move inertia sets in the voice continues to play in the, in in your mind and the body continues to perpetuate more of the imbalance, right? When you're out of balance, your body's going to crave more of the imbalance. So it's hard. That's why when people say, oh, I'm stuck, it's here are some tips to get unstuck. One of the main things that I will say is movement always. I always say, go for a walk, get out of your Mm. environment, just get out of the box. As I've been saying, get out of the box of your cubicle, of your home cubicle, get out of it. Just get out of it. Sometimes just changing your environment creates a different perspective. Taking actionable tactile steps for me have always been helpful because I feel like I can do it as opposed to me telling you self-love tips that are conceptual, that sound good in theory, but something that I can actually do right now for me has always been more effective as opposed to sit and meditate. Yes, meditation works for sure. Sit and meditate you know, meditate on the feeling, filling your own cup, being, being kind and compassionate to yourself, et cetera. Yes, that works too. But you know, it's hard if the neurological pathway that you've been building for years and years has been the, I'm not good enough pathway. I'm really fascinated by contra wisdom. And what I mean by that is the, sometimes the opposite of what you expect is true. And so having been in this field for a long time and having really applied it in yourself, what would be some, more, what most people would say would help promoting self-love that you found actually doesn't always necessarily work or maybe even harmful in some way? You know, I have a hard time with the manifestation stuff, you know. I, I do, I'm sorry, but I, I do because I feel like what gets the most PR is what you think and say. Change your thoughts, say an affirmation, but there's not a lot of emphasis on the do part of it. And it's absolutely not helpful for people like the people I grew up with, right? Where it's like, you live in poverty. You don't know where your next meal is coming from. But just think positively and do this affirmation. That's not helpful for this person. That is actually going to probably cause more anxiety and stress. So that is the one contra, I think, that I yes, yeah. feel <laughs> is is out of alignment. And, and I, I sp- speak about this quite often. And I think that's one of the reasons why I love to give actionable steps for people that they can actually do and they can get positive affirmation and they can get new habits put into place where it's actually going to be helpful as opposed to perpetuate the systems that are already in place. For someone who's just, since you also teach meditation, for those who are just starting out in their meditation journey, what is your way of introducing them to meditation? Oh, breathing is the one. Just breathe, breath meditation. Just focus on your breath. In, in for one, out for two. In for one, out for two. In for two, out for four. Just very simple systems, relaxing your body, focusing on your breath. If focusing on your breath is not comfortable, Uh, People that suffer from a lot of trauma or have a lot of anxiety, sometimes that could be, if you don't know how to guide the right breath work, that can be a little bit uh, agitating. So doing some type of sound, binaural beats, doing some 
sort of like sound bath or, you know, um, getting a sound bowl or listening to Tibetan bowls on YouTube, you know, just something that's going to create that relaxation, expansive awareness in your body. That's a really great way to start. Coming back to success, I'm wondering right now as I'm talking to you, if I have an unconscious or preconscious idea I've built over the years of what success should look like, just like I was sharing that I had this idea of what a successful routine looks like, you know, what, what my ideal day should be like. I was obsessed with creating these ideal routines for myself, which I'd only follow like 5% of the time, <laughs> but I'd love, to create, I'd love to create them. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm wondering if in our conversation, we can also look at, like, for example, in your case, you've already had the podcast, you've written the book, you know, it's, you, 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 you've spoken at many events in so many ways, you've touched so many lives. So now I'm wondering, do you have, as we are conversing, can we look at our own assumptions around success? Oh, I, if only I did more of this, or I achieved more of this, or I touched more lives, or I learned something more deeply, integrated something more deeply. Can we look at that aspect of it? Yes. Um, I talk about this all the time. You know, I, I, I wish I would have started the path earlier. I wish I would have started teaching earlier. I wish I would have just believed in myself earlier because you think, oh, I'd be further along the path. I'd be further along. I should have started Instagram back when everybody was doing Instagram, you know, <laughs> like that kind of thing. Oh, I should have started doing TikTok back when everybody started doing TikTok. You know, those things that you think conceptually hindsight's always 2020 and i feel like there's it it's wasted thought it's wasted mind mind space um if you want your mind to be busy doing something like create something do something write that yeah. book create that proposal um do that exercise however it is go for that walk go for that run sign up for that class take that workshop, make that film, you know, whatever it is that you're wanting to do now, now is the time. The time is now, you know, that, that is, I feel like going back to our definitions of what success is to me, that's a success every day. I, I say that when somebody asked me at one point, how did you end up getting in so much trouble? Like <laughs> what was the build up to this? Because they just could not conceive the fact that I tried to steal a police vehicle. Like they just could not see it. What was the story? Why were you trying to steal a police vehicle? It's just it's in the book. It, you if you get <laughs> okay, I'm gonna read the book. <laughs> loved, you can read all about it because that's the way it starts. Um, so I don't want to give it away, but I okay, made it out it just so you know. Um, but the I it, it's like small acts of defiance, right? Yeah. So it's just small acts of defiance started at a very young age. And I think about it now and I'm like, oh, these are still small acts of defiance. The way that I create a successful life, you know, the way that I am able to move up the ladder, climb my journey, you know, I still have those small acts of defiance, meaning I unplug when I need to. I focus on my work when I need to. I say no to opportunities that I know are not going to be, that they're not going to serve me just because I'm a people pleaser and I want to say yes to everybody. I have to be really mindful. So I think it goes back to what we were talking about, too much of a good thing. You know, one, something that's good. It's like the the difference between medicine and poison is dose. Mm. And so I, I feel like if we look at it from that perspective, it it'll serve us in the long run. So Rosie, it's been uh, really insightful uh, listening to you and it's made me reflect on my journey of success as well. And I hope uh, our listeners have also had a chance to reflect on their evolving definition of success. Uh, one thing I recommend uh, to people in my retreats and workshops is actually to come up with many different ideas of success. Of course, we have the traditional definition of success, which is you know money, power, fame, and those kind of things. And to challenge people to, can you come up with 10 different different ways that you would you could be successful? Creating a more comprehensive, well-rounded idea of what success could be. So as we complete our conversation today, I'd love for you to share your reflections on a message you'd like to leave our listeners with on the idea of success and about living our best life. 
I don't know that I can tell people what success is for them. I, I think what's better is to pose a question and to instead have them ask themselves what creates a deep sense of joy and fulfillment within themselves. And then the question of success should be the latter because I feel like when we are right in that space of what is going to bring us joy and contentment, then we can spring from there. My message has always been a message of cultivating more love and more presence and more kindness and more compassion and more understanding. And I feel that if we're looking at what success means, what happiness means, what fulfillment means, what love means, I feel those are the two anchors that we need to spring from. Thank you very much, uh, Rosie Acosta. Where can people find more of your work? <laughs> yeah, you can just go to radicallyloved.com. Thank you all for listening. Tune in next week for a brand new episode of Stories We Tell. Don't forget to rate and review wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're looking for new ways to explore conscious living, then please subscribe and join me on the Round Glass Living app. In addition to this podcast, you'll find courses, classes, recipes, music, and more to help you make positive changes while doing what you love. Until next time, I'm Nitishanti. Goodbye. The Stories We Tell is a part of Round Glass, holistic well-being at your fingertips. Find out more at roundglass.com.